referendums for funding schools operational and capital whereas the legislator has not provided adequate funding of pre-k-12 public education in wisconsin and by not doing so has not supported the intent of our representative form of government which is to protect the interest of minorities from the will of the majority a simple majority approving a school district referendum pits the haves against the have-nots enforces the will of the majority on the needs of the minorities who have no recourse but to submit. Whereas school districts are forced to rely on local taxpayer dollars to support their financial needs and the goodwill of the voters, referendums force the have-nots into an adversarial relationships with school districts. Whereas some school districts have marketed the fact that strong schools create strong communities, but it's only when selling their referendum to the voters, the reality is a referendum under the present system also creates losers who resent the winners and ultimately weakens and fractures communities along socioeconomic and racial lines. Whereas lack of equitable funding has damaged and restricted the ability of school districts to meet the needs of all students, leading to distrust between all of the stakeholders in order to support the rise of the charter schools as the solution in order to privatize education and profit from the well of taxpayer dollars. Whereas lack of equitable funding, especially in areas of high poverty and trauma, adds breaking point stress to many professional educators, causing fatigue, burnout, and in many cases, changing professions, which contributes to the current shortage of teachers. And whereas funding referendums place an onerous burden on many property taxpayers, those on fixed income, such as the elderly and disabled, are forced to choose between medicine, food, transportation, or housing, and low-income renters, as the current structure of the property tax system in Wisconsin is the most regressive tax in the state, more so than even the sales tax. The sales tax one can avoid by not buying. If one does not pay their property taxes or rent, they lose their home. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Wisconsin Association of School Boards urges all local school boards to educate themselves and their district's voters concerning the threat to our representative form of government and prompt them to get involved in lobbying their elected representatives to change the law so that the needs of all socioeconomic and racial groups are equitably protected. Two, urges all school boards to recognize that the negative impact uh, the adversarial relationship between the school district and segments of their community have on general support for publicly funded education and become actively involved in the effort to change the current law. Three, urges all school, all local school boards to consider the damage referendums may cause to their communities and work locally and publicly to equitably change the system. Four, urges all local school boards to consider the damage referendums may cause to their community. Oh, I read number three again. Number four, urges all local boards, school boards to recognize and counter the very real long-term threat to their existence by becoming actively involved to protect the viability of education of equal education for all children in their communities. Five urges all local school boards to consider that it is in their own self-interest to work for equitable public funding of education as the current system is threatening the foundation of professional educators in our state. And six urges all local school boards to advocate for changing the state constitution so property taxes can be structured more progressively. So income of the payee can be factored into the formula, for example, utilizing the median household income for the district for every thousand dollars earned over the median, they would pay more. And for every thousand dollars under, they would pay, pay less. Ultimately, the proposal would be revenue neutral to the taxing district, equity would be restored, and all the stakeholders and communities would benefit and heal. Uh, that is the referendum. Uh, that is the um, resolution language. Is there a motion? Is it okay if we have discussion? Oh, discussion. Is there any discussion? I guess I'd, I'd like to hear anybody's comments on, I guess, the concepts in there on. Uh, one thing that stuck out to me was the progress, progressive um, taxation on property taxes, which is a little different than obviously the concept that that this structured our property taxes at this point. And I, 
that's a piece that I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around supporting. And, and if someone can change my mind on it, I guess that's okay. But I guess I, if anyone has another understanding of that, I'd be open to that. So I'll jump in. Um, the way Mr. Scadam explained it at a Justice Overcoming Borders meeting that I was present for um, is basically, let's say that you you lived in your home for a number of years and the, prop, the, the value of your home has not fluctuated much. But if you go from working to retired, your income may be fluctuating. So I believe the spirit of this is to look at the median, um, the medium income of the community. And if your income is less than that, then you would pay slightly a, le a less portion of your taxes. And if you are still working and bringing in a, an income, um, you would pay slightly more, is my understanding of it. So it wouldn't be detrimental to the school district as far as funds received but it would be proportionate to what your living income currently is, um, not just solely based on the value of your home. Okay, so we're gonna collect the same amount of money, right? So is the idea to shift it from those that are elderly or on a fixed income to those that are working and have Call it not not fixed income because they could always just work more, right? So that's that's kind of the difference between those that are on a fixed income and those that are not. So they're still of working age, um, and because and, we're going to collect the same amount, so the intent is is to shift it from, you know, right? Is that is that the shift that would take that they're looking to take place then by that? So let's back up a little bit. So so a couple of things to keep in mind is. If we vote yes on this, this is being proposed to WASB. And then WASB will consider it. That does not mean it's gonna end up on the slate the delegates vote on in January. So right. let's say it passes our board, it goes to WASB. WASB said, yep, this has value. We want this the slate on the to be on the slate of final resolutions for our delegates to vote on in January. And let's say it gets approved then. Then it goes to the legislative body for WASB to work with our legislators. So really we can talk about the original intention and it may end up looking differently because it may be, um, let's not put more of a burden on people who are on a fixed income, disabled, elderly, et cetera, but whether or not that will cause people who are working and not on a fixed income to pay more, we can't really say. We can say what the intention and the goals are because something may be worked out between WASB's lobbying mechanism and our state representatives that will maybe we, this is a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? This is a spark to change, to change the laws and so schools are funded slightly differently to make up that gap. Okay, thank you. Can I jump in Go with ahead. a comment? Okay, I just, um, just, and I apologize if you mentioned this board member Levy, but I think another critical, a critical point is um, the idea of putting the tax burden, like taking the tax burden off property tax it's like having to pass referendums basically funding by referendum is very damaging both to people who are like you know limited income it's damaging to the school districts because it's an enormous amount of as you're experiencing you know time and energy uh, that goes into just the referendum planning and you know the whole process that takes away from like the instructional and you know whole child focus of the district if people are having to constantly like go to referendum which school districts go to off more often than we do, especially in rural areas. And so um, I think that's like another point too, just like fixing the funding model so that schools get more what they need from the state. Yeah, simply for me, I'm in favor of passing the resolution because it's just another idea that suggests an alternative way to fund our schools other than how we are currently funding the schools. Thank you. 
Is there any other discussion? So let me ask, and, I, and again, I apologize, but I think, you know, one of the things that we've talked about as a board is we want to make sure that we understand things that we're voting on, right? So I think, you know, the, some of the key points that Wayne makes in here is, in this resolution, is equitable funding. And so I just want to, I want to, those, those, those points that Amy and, and, and uh, Megan pointed out were, were valid, um, but if something's currently not equitable there's just there's a shift right it's got to go from one party to another that there's a so there's where the perceived or real right now there's something that's not equitable and we're trying to achieve equitable funding and i'm just somebody has to pay more somebody has to pay less because there's not more funding you know it's, it's coming out of somebody's pocket and I, and I i just reading through this resolution i can't i can't put my thumb on citizen a will pay less because of a b and c and citizen b will pay more because of a b and c and if i knew those things i say i could then make a judgment and say yeah that makes sense citizen b should pay more that would be equitable and citizen a should pay less but that would be equitable and i just i i, I don't I, I can't i can't come to a conclusion on that based on this so I, again i i would need some help getting there Board member Anderson, if I may, um, so like what the way that I'm thinking about it is, you know, property taxes are calculated differently than state and federal taxes, right? So like when you pay your state taxes, there are like tax brackets and there's like a whole, there's like a different, it's the determinants for who pays how much are different than those of property taxes because property taxes are driven by like the property value and like board member Levy was saying earlier, like let's say, you bought, you've, you've lived in your house for 30 years, you're retired, you're now on a fixed income, your property taxes go up, that's figured differently than the way that the state, you know, government is treating your income, right? And so it's those different determinants factoring into like who pays how much, right? Based on property tax, you know, funding schools by referendum, because right now, as you know, I sort of annoyingly continue to point out, <laughs> sorry, it's like, you know, the, the state's the uh, biennial budget that funds at the state level that funds schools is again funded schools with zero fundable dollars and it's it's gone down dramatically um and you can't go much further down than zero but the, the trend for the past 10 12 years has been uh to just deeply deeply cut school funding from what it was 10 12 years ago so for the last decade or so all that funding has been passed on to homeowners and property owners and in a community <clears throat> like the white in communities across Wisconsin, you know, you hear on the news, even nationally, there are all these housing crises and, you know, renter crises. A lot of that has to do with the property values, like being driven up to property values, but the expense of owning a property being driven up by the way that we're, we're taxing people, essentially. So if people, if we funded the school districts from the state level differently, somebody who's on a limited income is still going to be in that tax bracket. You know what I'm saying? So to me, that's the difference. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. I think it's a good discussion to have. And like I said, I know this is just a resolution to put this on the docket so it can be a, a wider discussion. And I think that's that's valid. Board President Levy, I'm not sure if you can see or not, but Board Member Winfield has his hand raised. Uh, I looked away from the screen, so I missed it. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Appreciate it. I just wanted to ask, um, Reading this resolution, I don't, I don't think it points to helping kids unless I'm missing something. It speaks to funding schools, which helps kids. <laughs> I get that part, but as in, like I know we have a fund that comes from the state. Now we we vote this. So we we vote on it tonight and it gets moved, they go somewhere else, it goes somewhere else. Are we confident that it's gonna us I was gonna say it, what benefits us not to vote for it, I guess that's what I'm saying. Well, I would say like so like with these resolutions, you know, there's like four hundred twenty one school districts across the state of Wisconsin. Each community that these school districts are in are in different financial situations. Um, 
So when we say like, this is how property taxes are used to fund schools, if we're a poor property tax district and they come with a different way to fund schools, that would be to our advantage. So the, the, the whole process with the, with the proposals are just that this is how when uh, the delegates come together through that political process, 421 different districts come together to agree to work towards these changes because they think these changes uh, will benefit. So whether we vote for it or against it, it's going to, it's just one idea competing with other ideas to fix what some people consider to be a problem. Some people say our district has all the money it needs and we don't care about the districts that don't, you know, so that would be, they would be seeking no change, you know, so that, that's kind of a space. And then just, and like I said, this is just one idea and I have to compete with other ideas for which would ultimately gain um, approval and then move forward to be used as a strategy to change things. And if I may, I'll just say one other thing, like aside from whether or not we support this, I'm just really proud and excited that we have a community member. Um, and, and I know this was a team effort behind the scenes that took the time to craft a resolution and trusted us enough to come to us and present it to us and say, hey, we want a partner. We know there's a referendum on the horizon and we want to put our support behind that. We also want you to consider an issue that's important to us around the progressiveness or regressiveness of property taxes. So um, like this is how the system works. When we have community members and groups that are engaged and invested in the process and, and come showing their work, and we again, we don't know if this is going to get past the, the barriers that it needs to in order to get approved in January. But I'm just really excited that we have partners that are invested in, in putting in work. And I'll just add another way to look at it is um, since, you know, we as a board have to put pop, you know, resolutions forward, the community wrote their own resolution, those members, and they're asking us to consider it because we're their local board and it can only get through by us. So just as we approve board member Miller's um, and you say that, you know, being a board member, she has the, the privileged position because she's been elected to write and directly contribute. The community members came to public comment, uh, asked us to take it up as we're conducting our other business of uh, developing interview questions. We added this to the agenda. Um, to uh, give to give respect to the effort that was made. All right, now I think we've all kicked it around. Um, are we, is there a motion or is discussion done or is there any other points of discussion that people would like to add? And then as we've discussed before, then we vote, we just, we vote. I move approval of the resolution submitted by Wayne Scadam for consideration for WASB. I'll second. It's been moved and properly seconded. Moved by board member A. Levy, seconded by board member Megan Miller. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed signify by saying nay. Nay. Okay. Uh, the ayes have it. The motion passes. And this will go on to... Um, with the other resolution that we have for WASB. All right. We're now at our next item, uh, development of interview questions for uh, our superintendent interview. Our superintendent interview, uh, we've, we've been planning since uh, Dr. Keeser let us know, we knew that we would have to hire a superintendent and we've gone through our process provided interim superintendent coverage in between, working with our WASB consultant. Uh, we're now at the point where we have reviewed candidates' applications, and we are preparing for our first interview uh, on Monday and Tuesday, and we have to develop our questions. We do have questions, um, and um, Board Member Schneider and uh, Anderson are not here, but they have provided feedback 
which I'll drop in along the way as we're going. Um, and one of the things that I'm thinking about as we proceed is um, we do have our um, the questions that we developed uh, for the interim, and I guess I kind of use those as a, as a starting space. Um, and then we can add around, subtract, and we'll uh, check in with each board member to see what they would like to add or um, go on from there. Mrs. Shope, are you able to type for us? Yes, I can do that. In case we need to type. All right. So, um, before we get started here, one thing that I would say is like, so kind of is summarizing um, some of board member Schneider's comments. Um, is just that kind of, he said, mentioned that the questions we have developer in the interim are okay. He's concerned about things like referendum and experience, uh, discipline and behavior, uh, communication between COLAC staff and community, um, questions about student absenteeism, and then achievement gap and test scores. Uh, and board member Anderson, as we go through, has provided um, some of the highlights from the questions uh, that we were given by the WSB consultant. And board member Leo, I see your hand. Um, and then we'll uh, whip around the room as we go also. Board member Levy. Thank you. Um, what do you think about the idea? We're definitely gonna have an opening question to allow the candidates to tell us about themselves, why they think they would be a good fit for Beloit. We have the legal question at the end, which we have to ask, um, I think, and please someone correct me if I'm wrong, that we all agree we also need a question about strategic plan and the referendum. Um, so right there, that's four. Um, if we could start with knowing our question range. So as we go through, um, we just have an idea of how much we need to pare down. That would be helpful. Question, we had 10 questions on paper uh, and our, during our interim superintendent interview, we gave them about an hour and a half to answer. Since we gave them the time, they filled the time. I do think that even as packed as the questions were, uh, it could be answered in an hour. Um, so we worked a lot of things in, in those 10. Uh, like I said, but the time frame we're working with is an hour. And I think that uh, what we did to allow those candidates um, to address questions during the balance of their time and the fact that we're gonna let them have the questions ahead of time, they might structure and build their, um, their interview. So I would say whatever we come up with or choose to ask, the candidates will have one hour to fill it in. And you know, some questions and answers may build upon others. So I'd say like 10 is what we're gonna put on a paper maybe. Minus the other parts that you described. Any other thoughts on that? So are we just going to go category by category? Uh, yeah, let me, um, I'll just kind of start us with the, um, what we wrote. I will go category by, I got my papers can mixed up here a little bit. All right, so I think in our first category, like in the opening, uh, we started something with, you know, please tell us about yourself. Uh, what is it about the school district of Beloit that led you to apply for this position? And what experiences will you bring to the district that will assist us in meeting our goals as outlined in our strategic plan? So that we did mention strategic plan in that first question. And um, board member Anderson, uh, Spencer Anderson, uh, highlighted C in that biographical section. That's where we're at now, the biographical section, uh, wanting them to tell us what led them to apply for the position in the school district of Beloit. May I ask a question for Ms. Shope? Ms. Shope, I have, I don't know if you have the document that board president Lee has, but I just opened it 
would it be helpful for you if I drop the base language into the chat and then you can adjust it as the conversation moves? Yes, that might be helpful. I do have like the template of questions. I just, I don't know what you asked at the um, interim interviews. Got it. I'll put it and then if it's helpful, you can, you can just grab it from there. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I guess in that biographical section, um, is there more, less, do you want to change it? Do you want to add anything else to it? I would eliminate the strategic plan part. I think that should be its own question. But other than that, I, I don't have an issue with it. I agree. C was the, the leading question there to get the discussion open and let them, let the candidate kind of fill out some thoughts based on that. So again, that was the same. That's the same one I picked out of such uh, <laughs> biographical area. Okay. So you said separate out the strategic plan part so that uh, addressing the strategic plan is its own thing. Yeah, on my list, I actually put that under vision that we would have a strategic plan question. Okay. Uh, how do other board members feel about that? I'm, I'm in agreement. I, I agree. You. I agree. All right, so uh, please tell us about yourself. What is it about the school district board that led you to apply for the position? What experience did you bring to the district? Period. All right, strategic plan to come back. All right, uh, Mr. Shope, you got that? I do. Okay, uh, number two. Just a minute. Com school community relations. Uh, we started with how will you inspire trust and proactively engage the community and media to ensure the district's message is communicated and perceived accurately? Please provide an example. Tell us about a time when you had to communicate difficult or unfavorable information to a team or an individual. What were the circumstances and how was closure reached is what we asked last time. Uh, board member Anderson Spencer had um, B, how will you inspire trust? <laughs> oh, excuse me. How will you inspire trust and positive working relationships with school personnel and community? Describe how you solicit input from staff members, how you respond to requests that cannot be granted due to procedural or financial restraints. And tell us about a time when you had to communicate difficult or unfavorable information. So I think that the difference that he has is uh, describe how you solicit input from staff members and how you respond to requests that cannot be granted is the variation that he has. That would be E in the um, in the template. Other board members. I'm fine with what we currently have, but the, the the portion that's not included, if we could just put a pin in there and see if that would fit under one of our headers. Okay. The soliciting input from staff members and how they respond to requests that cannot be granted. Yeah, if we could hold off on that to possibly interpersonal relationships, um, that may be a good fit there. Okay. Uh, other board members? Two? Anything more to add? or? Yeah, the only two out of like those uh, sample questions that I saw was, you know, A and F, and I think those kind of already get, those kind of get combined into what we previously set up. So I think um, like category number two, I think we've got covered. Okay. And then we'll come back to see how we'll get board member Anderson's uh, knee in there. Okay, so we're comfortable moving forward. Number two is done. All right, that's what I see. Uh, number three. Three is vision. So this is, I think, where board member Levy said, let's include the strategic plan. Uh, what we asked was, how do you communicate the district's vision strategic plan to staff 
and the community? How would you ensure that the vision slash strategic plan is understood and implemented across the district? Describe your interaction with the Board of Education um, regarding the district's vision slash strategic plan is what we wrote. So I think uh, every one of those sentences has strategic plan in it. That's very much about the strategic plan. The only well, thing that I, oh, go ahead, Board Member Winfield. I was just going to ask, can we um, add how do you measure success as it relates to the plan? That's a good addition, I think. So that's a contribution is how do you measure success in relation to the plan? Board member Levy. Um, I, I think one, that's a really good point. I think we can add that uh, just with a small shift with how would you ensure that the vision slash strategic plan is understood, implemented, um, and what's the word I'm looking for? Um, measured? That work and measured. And then also when, when whoever's gonna send out the questions to the candidate that is not us, um, make sure that they have a copy of our strategic plan so they can, I know it seems basic, but just make sure that they're reviewing that in preparation. Well, what I, um, what will happen is uh, I'll take the text that Ms. Schultz provides us and I'll send that to Dan Nirad. Um, as far as like the strategic plan, I mean, even when citizens have asked questions, I just went back to what was in the slide deck that the, um, administration presented to us uh in august we went over it after we approved it finally so that would be the those are the objectives and the priorities uh so i think that you know the, the questions and then that part of the plan uh dan nirad will have that and he will send that to the candidates all right so we got measure in there Ms. Shope, are you, uh, you got a vision for three? You okay with that? Yes. All right. Um, Board Member Miller, you there? I'm here. Okay, just checking, just checking. Make yeah, sure I'm just listening. It's gotcha. awkward to jump in when I can't see people, so I'm just, I'm hanging back. I got my stuff. Gotcha, okay, okay. Just trying to make sure we're, we're all on the train together. All right, uh, four. Are we at four now? Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, so this one started out as an interim superintendent. What strategies would you use to develop a positive working relationship with the board? So I would think to strike out the word interim. How will you communicate with the school board outside of the boardroom? What do you do when you disagree with a board member? Um, Since you just called on me to talk, <laughs> I really liked 4E. 4E? Uh, let me see, 4E, E. Okay, that was one that board member uh, Spencer Anderson listed also. The school board is comprised of persons with divergent backgrounds and opinions. What strategy would you use to unite a board to make it more productive and efficient? And the F part, I'd like to throw it all in there. The F part, uh, board member Spencer Anderson also included how do you personally evaluate your job performance and what is your expectation of feedback from the school board? Yeah, I think I'd throw in that, that portion of question F, I'd agree. I think, you know, part of our go forward strategy is going to be, you know, a little more consistent feedback, right? And I'd like to understand how they want to hear that feedback because we want to make sure we're, we're making progress on this strategic plan that we put a lot of work into, right? So I think if we can incorporate F, whether it's a separate question or rolled into E or or something else, I think I think F is a is another piece of that that I want them to speak to. Right. I think that this is a, also an important time for us to throw in the information about the CESA 6 evaluation. Um, because as we're talking about that feedback, that is part of it. And that is something that uh, they would do well to look up and understand. So in four, um, as an interim superintendent, as a superintendent, what strategies we use to develop a positive work, working relationship with the board? How will you communicate with the school board outs, 
I, outside of the boardroom, what do you do when you disagree with a board member? Adding E and F. Board member Levy, are you dropping things in the chat for um, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Schultz at the same time? Here to help. Yep. Okay. So I, I, cause I just see things happening on the screen. Do you drop E and F in there together? Is that uh, what happened? Separately, yes. Okay. Um, so, so, yeah, that's fine. All right. And I don't know, how, how would you all approach the CISA 6 stuff in that question? Or what are your thoughts? That's a little cool better. I mean, can we just add? Um, I like I liked what I think I think it was Gordon Member Anderson saying that um, you know about feedback and things like that. I mean, can we just kind of craft that into like describe you know like since this board has already chosen to follow the CISA six model, maybe tell us about your communication sound preferences for receiving feedback and you know finding consensus or something like that. Yeah, I like something about after reviewing the CISA 6 evaluation, um, which, of course, we would provide along with the strategic plan, um, or after reflecting on the CISA 6 model, how will you solicit feedback from board members? Something to that effect. Actually, the second part, I, don't, I think it's E. Let me double check. Um, a school board is comprised of personal and divergent, but all of that stuff, I... I really don't think it's the superintendent's job. Well, one, I think our board is together. But two, I don't think that's the superintendent's job to bring the board together. to be right. Like, that's the responsibility of the board to work well as a cohesive group, which I think we intentionally do work to do. Um, so I don't want to say that's a wasted question, but I just I don't think that's the most appropriate question to ask in the interview. Uh, well, I mean, I understand what you're saying. Sometimes, you know, you don't know what the person's experiences are, and sometimes closing the gaps between the working relationships is something, I mean, that you might want a candidate to speak to their ability to do. To unite the board? Like, the superintendent has a huge job. I don't think that person should be, first of all, our board is united. But if we weren't, I don't think that should also be added to the responsibility of the superintendent. Like the board is comprised of adult professionals and it's our job to work together cohesively. I think, I, I think the intent of the question is not to unite us in a 7-0 vote, but to unite um, people behind the strategic plan to do things, um, to get things done. So things are so it's not a situation where things don't get done. Is is a simple simple space, but I understand the point that you're making. You just don't think it fits us. Any other feedback from other board members? I don't know, Miss Short. What do you have for number four? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. There's a paragraph. <laughs> so, so I have what you used before, but as the superintendent, what strategies would you use to develop a positive working relationship with the board? How will you communicate with the school board outside of the boardroom? What do you do when you disagree with a board member? Then I had a note to add both E and F, which is the school board is kind comprised of persons of divergent backgrounds and opinions, what strategies would you use to unite a board to make it more productive and efficient? How would you personally evaluate your job performance and what is your expectation for feedback from the school board? Then there was the conversation about doing that the Board of Education already follows or after reviewing and following the CISA 6 model, how would you solicit feedback from board members? So I wasn't quite sure what portions of that should be deleted and what portions were being kept. I think, you know, I, I think that um, this is a place I, I, I would take the question. I mean, because the, the adding E and F are, are there. Um, a board member Levy, I know board member um, uh, Miller start, went with E. Board member Miller, is it important for you to have that unite in there? Or is it just uh, the idea of what is the superintendent doing to make a, help the board become productive and efficient? Is yeah, I mean, I think that's really what I was getting at because, like, I guess what, what I wasn't—I wasn't thinking about unite the same way the board member Levy addressed it. It's more like you know, 
if there's um, everybody's different background, right? And, every, and not everybody has the same like level of experience and expertise over every single issue. And I think it's important for an administrator to be able to get to know each board member, understand their strengths and opportunities where they need to um, kind of build understanding around certain topics or practices fill that in so that we can kind of like move forward efficiently. So that would, that would work for me. I, the, what I would like to do in the, the part about the CESA six model is I would like to not ask them a question about the CESA six model, but to inform them uh, as it already is, that that is what we selected. And if they get to uh, the, the second round, we'll have more detailed question about it. But it gives a, you know, it it, it, it drops that um, that breadcrumb of something that they may need to know. So it's not so much that they have to answer it, but you know, we'll get into it. You know, it's just that evaluation conversation about evaluating the superintendent, and this is a method we've chosen already. So, are we so, fine with that? so it could just be mentioned, CISA six model. I mean, is that okay. something where, like, when we email them the question, we can just say, like, I like how board member Levy suggested, like, just to attach it along with the strategic plan and say, like, here are interview questions. With regard to question four, we're using, you know, ask in the context that we're using the season six model or something like that. So it doesn't have to be a part of the questions, but then everybody's informed. Right. I think that that is an, uh, it's a, it's an attachment in a, um, governance meeting that Dr. Keeser presented to us too. So I have those pages to add to what goes to Dan. So are, you, are you saying we should keep the original number four and just strike interim? Well, we, yeah, I thought, I thought we had was the original number four, the word interim removed, E and F added and attaching the CISA six model. Do we really need to keep E and F? I thought that's kind of where people were at. They're like, yeah, that rounds it out really well. The candidate will speak to what they speak to. It's just paper. And did I hear that we are or are not removing the word unite? If we're keeping E and F, I'm fine with keeping E and F as they are. I just think that's a lot for one question, but I, I yield to the will of the board. Are we satisfied with number four? Ready to go to number five? All right. Seeing one head shake and the other shaking. I'm just assuming Megan is. No. <laughs> okay. So here, here's the thing. Um, if we are going to attach CISA 6 and it's just for information and we're not asking a question about, I would take off F. So I would do 4 and then add E if that's what others want. But talking about personal evaluate and expectations for feedback from the board, I think that goes into evaluation and I think that's more appropriate for the second round. Uh, what are your feelings, people? I like the idea of maybe leave that for the second round. I haven't seen, you know, we haven't really been given a list of like second round questions that I think, because they certainly would be different, but I like the idea of that could be something that could be a second round question. And not to take us off track, I, I agree with you, board member Anderson, board member Levy, that would be a very good second round question. Uh, when we did um, Dr. Teaser's second round interview and for the other candidates, we solicited questions from the community and um, those informed how we crafted our second round interview questions. So I just want to like throw that out there for later, just, you know, kind of put in the back of your mind so if that's something we might want to do again. I think the community came out with some outstanding questions and a lot of those made it in um, to the second round. Yeah, I worked hard on those when I was just a community member. Yeah, board member Levy, I agree with you. And, and actually, it's like board member Anderson, like, so for example, like how several of us are agreeing, like that, that, you know, what we're talking about, like with some of the stuff from four that could go into a second round interview question, 
you know, we can kind of keep that highlighted to see what the, if, if we choose to go that way, see what the community brings back. And then we can always like tweak and craft language around to make sure that we bring what we just discussed now into that second round. You know what I'm saying? It's not like we're just going to like take it all verbatim. Like we can, we can craft and um, tweak and all that kind of stuff, you know? Gotcha. So Ms. Show, it sounds like for four, drop F. Okay. All right. Number five. Five. Operations and finance. Uh, we started with we are in a deficit budget cycle. Describe the factors, processes, and priorities you will consider when developing the school district budget with the board. Describe your experience planning and executing a referendum. Were you successful? Why or why not? And board member um, Schneider did want to make sure that there was some referendum question and something to speak to experience with that. It's a simple budgeting question um, and then referendum planning. Does, do you all want to add more? Or? I'm good with five as is. As is? Okay. All right, five as is, Mr. Schultz. Okay. Six. Look at us. We went this fast when we did it last time, too. Six, curriculum and instruction. Uh, board member Schneider asked kind of like an idea about speaking to the achievement gaps, um, our test scores. Board member Anderson in six uh, highlighted B, E, F, L, N, O. I'm going to come back to some of those in a minute. And our six was, what is your plan to share the district assessment results with the board and community? Describe your philosophy on student discipline. What are you communicating with principals and teachers about managing the learning environment and setting expectations for student behavior? How will you hold administrators accountable for students learning and the overall culture of their schools? How do you plan to prioritize the learning environment in the context of the ongoing pandemic? I think we had a couple more COVID concerns a couple months back. So I really like E, well, I had 6D and 6E, but I was thinking about um, how to address kind of gap information. It may be something to the extent of provide examples of how you use data to keep the board maybe and community abreast of issues and trends related to student achievement and particularly opportunity gaps or in particular opportunity gaps. So it's a, a little bit of a blend of D, E, and then adding that kind of that gap piece. Okay. I think... Just kind of speaking of what is written in that question, it's kind of like test scores. The discipline questions are in there. And the learning environment. So I don't, I don't know if we feel like some of that needs to get sorted out or. But that is like student achievement and. Um, you know, a productive learning environment is what we have. So I hear a couple different things in here and maybe some of the old question falling apart. Uh, board member Miller, can you repeat again which one you had? Sure. I had originally highlighted six D as in David and E as an elephant. And what I kind of tried to craft in there was like based on the language in E, provide examples of how you use data to keep the board and community abreast of issues and trends related to student achievement, in particular opportunity gaps, plural. Okay. Um, other board members, and board member lady, maybe I, I saw you drop something in there. I'm not sure what it was. I put D, E, and F. 
from kind of the bank of questions, just in case board members want to reflect on that and make recommendations. Anybody else in six? I would just say I also thought that F was the kind of the key one in that. So if there's a way to incorporate some of that, um, obviously talks about student achievement um, and, and communicating communicating that those expectations, you know, to the students. And you know, to me, it talks about that whole section six talks about curriculum and assessment, but it's really about communication of those expectations. And I think F incorporates that. I think E and F can be combined, I think, to to capture that, I think. Okay, ENF, Board Member Levy, you're sharing? Yeah, I just actually think, that, okay, so I think we need to modify our, the six that we originally had. Okay. I really like what Board Member Miller said with E and kind of added um, community into that um, and then talked about, I believe, achievement gap. Um, I like that. And I think that the discipline part and the accountability part separate. should be a separate question. Okay. So let's, let's, so it kind of sounds like uh, for six, it should be E and F together. That works for me. Okay. And then we'll maybe we'll end up with 11 questions, but we're addressing student achievement and that communication student achievement itself, and then the communication that to the community. And then uh, what is the student discipline, code of conduct, behavior question that we're gonna ask, because that's the other part that's missing, or like productive learning environment. So if we pair our original six down to focus on discipline and accountability, and then our our new question that comes from this i think should be a combination of e and f that talks about academic rigor and how how the superintendent will communicate progress to the board and the community all right so is that something like so we got the academic question which is the e and the f part and the other part that we're going to have for six which is this would be like six and seven is describe your philosophy on student discipline what are you communicating with principals and teachers about managing the learning environment and setting expectations for student behavior? How will you hold administrators accountable for student learning and the overall culture of their schools, period? Okay. All right, so Mrs. Schultz, in, um, in six, we're dropping the first question, what is your plan? And we're keeping the describe your philosophy. What are you communicating sentence? What are you communicating send the ends of the question mark? How would you hold? And last part of schools and dropping the how do you plan to? Okay. And then there's if that's six, then number seven is ENF. So we are on to seven, which may now be eight, which is interpersonal relationships. Uh, we started with how will people recognize you as approachable and interested in receiving feedback and input concerning school issues? Describe how you develop and maintain relationships with all employee groups how will you share what you learned and accomplished with the permanent superintendent? So we'll probably strike that last part of the question. Um, board member Spencer Anderson had A1, how you introduce yourself to staff in the community and make yourself visible during your first 100 days on the job. So it's almost like a 100-day plan is what they're asking. B, how will people recognize you as approachable, which we have in the question. Uh, e, describe how you develop and maintain relationships with all employee groups. And I, many people believe that the school is the center of the community. What does this statement mean to you and how would it affect your decisions as superintendent? I think the I part is something that we have not had in the question. Uh, how would you all like to approach 
uh, that seven, that interpersonal relationships. I like I, but I think that would be really good for a second round. Okay. So we're save I for a second round. That's yeah. just my two cents, but if other people feel differently. No, I agree with I in the second round. Perfect, man. Because right now we have B and E in that seven section that what we had previously, but I would love to find a way to have A. And it, we have two A's on our list, um, but I think talking about how how our superintendent's going to inject themselves into the community and really be the voice of the district and and be be bigger than the district right and and be part of the community i think is something that you know it's a different question that we ask then we ask the interim this is something we're asking somebody that we're hoping is going to be here long term and i i think um i like i like b and e um but i would love to see a worked into there more so than e so whether it's a Maybe A and B combination instead of a B and E combination, maybe. A one or, or A two. Well, I think you could you could pick even the second A because I, well, it's the first hundred days or the next five thousand days. I you know. Gotcha. You know we're so, not, Yeah, I think I think that one could be just the first one would be okay. Okay, so you're saying seven A two and B. And and B correct. Um, how will you make yourself part of the fabric of the community? How will people recognize you as approachable and interested in receiving feedback and input concerning school issues? I'm fine with A and B, A two and B. Knowing that I is in the hip pocket for the second interview, like like Amy said, yeah. Right. All right. So we we are in agreement. For seven? Yeah, I think that's fine. Yep. All right. We're on number eight, which might be our number nine, leadership and collaboration. Um, we wrote, how do you approach goal setting with the board? The board has given district administrators the responsibility to continue projects already underway. How will you support the administrators with these projects? Tell us about a time when your leadership was challenged and caused you to be frustrated that others did not agree with your ideas. How did you react and respond? Describe how you coach and support an administrator to ensure that he or she performs at a high level. That was our question. Like I said, that was written more towards our situation with an interim, but I do think there's still some good parts in there. I like the, I like the frustrated part to understand how people operate when they're frustrated. Very important. Um, board member uh, Spencer Anderson highlighted B, C, D, G, J, L, O, and Q on, on, on that one. So there's different parts in there. I know we're not going to work all those in possibly, but um, as we begin, we can kind of explore what some of those are in that seven. Or in that eight, I don't know. I mean, we can jump around with what others have right now first before we get into that. I like the current question, but take out the interim specific part. Um, would the board is given district administrators responsibilities to continue projects and how would you support them? Um, so not that that part. We, yeah, so not that we need to keep it, but I'm just going to drop it in the chat so you see what it looks like without that, and then we can build on it. Oh, so you're at the, how do you approach, how do you approach goal setting with the board? And then go right to tell us about a time. Okay. And I think that's important because the superintendent's responsibility is to recommend and the board's responsibility is to accept, modify, or reject. Um, and so I think it's great to start having an honest dialogue about, you know, it's not personal if the board modifies a recommendation or, you know, so I think it would be a good conversation to have. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think what C does, which was kind of, you know, it's not in there as specifically, but, you know, how they coach their you know, their team, which is going to be the principals, um, 
you know, I think, I think in our past discussions, we've talked about, we, we definitely want, you know, that accountability to, to, to really come at that principal level because that's where it's going to hit each individual building. So, um, you know, a superintendent performing at a high level doesn't mean a lot if the, if this, if their principles aren't right. So I, I'm great with the current question, but, uh, add to it. Well, maybe it's just a tweak. I don't know. I think, I think, um, maybe it's, it's part of the, not part of the question, but part of the discussion. And if it's not asked, it certainly would be a follow up on my part to say, you know, the expectation is to develop that, that leadership team because you're not in the buildings, you know, and, and we know that we want to make sure that the, that principal level position is just as, you know, fantastic as it can be. So. So board member Anderson, let me take you back to our new six. And the last part of that is how would you hold administrators accountable for student learning and the overall culture of their school? Do you feel like the spirit of what you're suggesting is, is included in that part of our new six? or we need to do something different with this current question? No, I think, no, I think we can get there. And if needed a, a follow-up question in the, in the flow of the interview, we'll get there. So no, you're right. I, I think that's there already. Thank you. Okay. So what is a, just for, it sounded like we were, it sounded like it's much of the original question, but I wasn't. So the, the eight is we're looking at it. <clears throat> Feel free to jump in and, and edit to, to anyone on call. How do you approach the goal setting? How do you approach goal setting with the board? And then it goes into tell us about a time when your leadership was challenged and caused you to be frustrated that others did not agree with your ideas. How did you react and respond? And I think it's it's really important to have both of those because our reaction is that immediate thing of in the moment. But then how did you go back? How did you respond? And I think it's important for people to understand the difference there. So hopefully they will pick up on that new. Well, hopefully they're listening to this meeting and they'll pick up on the nuance of those two different things um, and then describe how you coach and support. Do we need to keep that at the end? Oh, the coach and support part. Yeah. I would modify that to like, how will you prepare your administrators to interact with the board, like the central office people for presentation, for when they're taking direct questions from the board, the feedback, the input. I mean, to me, that's a part of that's a part of an understanding. And I would like to know like how that is prepared. We we talked to some of those things earlier this week. No, I like that. And and as the superintendent taking on the role of making sure that their team is prepared to give a thorough presentation to the board and is prepared to, to answer questions and provide pertinent information so we can make good decisions. So, I mean, if somebody, well, if we go to adding or crafting that level, um, are you expert, how do you prepare um, administrators that work under you to present to the board? To present their work to the Board of Education is that would be simple like that. I was typing too fast, wrong too, but you get the gist. right, right, right. Okay, so is uh, are we good with eight there? All right. And now we're on to nine, which is probably 10. Um, I'm gonna keep, keep hold of our, our counting, nine. Uh, a vocal member of the community brings a complaint against a staff member. How would you handle the complaint? Explain your experiences working with employee discipline and investigations with the board attorney. Um, reflecting on that question, we have a complaint policy um, that was a little bit more towards a specific need that we had in a different situation. Uh, we might ask how they have worked with the board attorney on issues, but I, I kind of think like number nine is like a, it's a, a it's a time dated question. 
unless you just want to know how they're going to handle investigations or how they would I'm hoping the answer is I, I will review and follow policy and work with with board attorneys to make sure that we're being fair and consistent. Um, so I would actually be fine with eliminating that question. All right. So in nine, then if we're taking that one out, um, that was like the legal question. I mean, I, I still think that like what's necessary is that. On the wrong page. I think that um, there's still things that are, you know, I'm thinking like the HR issues. There, there's there are things that come along that I that I still want to know um, about the person. Well, we haven't gotten to the human resources personnel section yet. Oh, well, not. Well, yeah, that's that's nine. Then. So let me start with that part, because I think that really is what that was. Uh, board member Spencer Anderson highlighted B, E and K. T uh, tell us the time you had to defend a hiring decision. E, how do you use educator effectiveness systems, policies and practices to retain or improve teachers and administrators? And K, I like those three questions. Uh, what is the process you would use to revise the employee handbook? How do you communicate revisions to stakeholders? Uh, so that is the handbook, which is important. Um, educator effectiveness, which is evaluation, which is important. And B, hiring, uh, defending hiring decisions. So I do like the B, E, and K of that in the HR part. Other board members? I give oh, a minute I'm visual, so I'm gonna drop no. those in the chat and then people are gonna have a chance to look. You said B, E, and K? Yes, board member Spencer Anderson highlighted B, E, and K. Um, I like 9R. R? Yeah. It describes the elements of a comprehensive and effective system of teacher and administrator performance evaluation. Well, there's only two in the state. <laughs> so they can describe what, well, what I'm... But I, I would be interested to hear in what... I mean, I'm not, like, married to it. What, what, the reason it caught my interest is because it's, I want to see, like, where we are in terms of like how we value you know what i mean i just like i think you can tell a lot about a person's priorities based on the answer to a question like that right how they approach yeah but it, you know so I, I understand that you know there are models right like i know that but their answer is not going to be oh i like pizza sex like i want to know what and why you know what they like and why i want to hear a little bit about their experience you know, how important do they feel it is, for what reason. However, again, I'm not married to it. It's fine. Well, do you want to start something out like, you know, before you get to the the EE question that's in B, E, and K, just about, like, what is the role of evaluation? Like, how do you, how do you view performance evaluation for teachers and administrators? Well, sure. And, I mean, you know, what, yeah, what are the most... You, are you like wanting what elements most inform, you know, because it, like if our end goal is to, you know, best serve all of our children, right, as, as in a whole child way and to raise their achievement, what are the elements, right, of, of, of an effective system, you know, kind of how it's written, um, are like the, the best lovers to pull, right? Like how does your feed, like how do you view the role of feedback in student achievement and kind of the goals that we have? Sort of what I'm getting at. Do you want to add it to B, E, and K and R? I mean, do you feel like, okay, so like I like B, E, and K. Like I just, I'm just saying I just had R highlighted before, you know, we started. Um, there's a lot of, like, there's that emphasis on like retention, which is very important. There's, um, there's a lot of like good kind of logistic information in here. But I think if we're getting at like 
you know, we're trying to execute a strategic plan and we want it to be one in which we can, you know, we can keep our goals and continuously reevaluate and, and, and improve. So, like, I want to know what their, I guess, like, in terms of, like, what role does, like, HR and evaluation play in making sure that strategic plan is going to effectively serve children the way that we want it to, right? So, I would just, like, I would like to hear from somebody, like, how, because, like, sometimes, like, I feel like in the past, we've heard sort of a scarcity mindset from administrators, which is fair. Like there's only so much time and there's only so many resources that you have, but I want to know, I guess what I'm hoping that we find is somebody who can sort of kind of like, so I like the word comprehensive in there, sort of comprehensively integrate that feedback and evaluation into how they are implementing the strategic plan and serving the kids in our community. You know what I'm saying? Well, I mean, not that we're answering the questions for the candidates, but, how that someone prioritizes evaluation so that it actually happens and that the benefits that should come from that are used to improve the system. Is that what you're saying? Or do you, are them expressing their belief about this is my philosophy of evaluation and performance evaluation and what it does for the system, you know, like they're articulating. Yeah, ex exactly. You know, sorry to interrupt, but yeah, that's exactly where I'm at. And like, you know, maybe some examples of how they've used, feedback and evaluation to, you know, build capacity and better serve, you know, empower a district to better serve its students. You know what I'm saying? Like how will they use, um, how will you use uh, feedback and evaluation to, um, to further the goals and priorities of the strategic plan? Yeah, because honestly, from a teacher perspective, that's something that would be important to me if I were a teacher, because like, if, you know, you want to, if you have a climate, there are plenty of administrations in this state that maintain a climate where if there's an administrator in your classroom, oops, it's bad or you're in trouble. But like what I, what I think successful school districts, kind of the culture that they have is like administration should be giving feedback and, and, and administrators should want feedback because we should all be on the same page that like we're all continuous improvers. Right, we're all reflective practitioners, and like there should be like a culture of continuous improvement and a sense of like you know safety and pride in getting feedback because that's like what a characteristic of a healthy, successful school district is. So I would think that how somebody answers that question and any examples that they have would be really important uh, to help us understand that that's the type of leader they would be. Okay, is that okay? So here's sorry. Go here's my two cents. I would actually drop K because the employee handbook is great, but I think it's off course to the spirit <clears throat> of the question that we're asking. So I just merged E and K and then added on what I believe Board Member Miller was saying. So I'll just read it out real quick. Um, tell us a time when you had to defend a hiring decision. How do you use the educator effective the system policies and practices to retain or improve teachers and administrators how do you use feedback <coughs> and evaluation to further the goals in, in our strategic plan well the handbook yeah. the handbook part i believe needs to stay uh the handbook is you know since act 10 the handbook provisions and things that are in there that's a really big deal it's not just like it's it's a it's a it's a major piece where the relationship between uh, the working of the teachers and the district um, it, it would be important to hear what they have to say about the handbook. So how about this? I, then I see this as two separate questions, and we could start with tell us about a time when you had to defend a hiring decision, and then go into the K the handbook. And then the remainder of what's there would be a separate question. How do you feel about that? That sounds great to me. Okay, I am visual. So I'm going to put those two separate questions in if you just give me a second. And then people can kind of think about it. So there's the first one. And then there's the second one. There's the handbook part of it. So the first one, tell us of a time when you had to defend a hiring decision. What is the process you would use to revise the employee handbook 
how do you communicate revisions to stakeholders? That's the first question. And then the proposed second question, how do you use the educator effectiveness systems, policies and practices to retain or improve teachers and administrators? How have you used feedback and evaluation to further the goals? Um, I would say in, in the R, however, um, in our strategic plan. Or I would say in a strategic plan, since you're asking them to specifically reflect on what they've already done. So instead of our, it would say A. All right. Anybody else or in additions or is there satisfaction there? Okay. All right. So we are now at uh, 10 last question. This is the, this is the equity question. Uh, equity, diversity. Um, we asked, what does it mean to you for you to have a commitment to diversity and equity? <laughs> oh, excuse me. How, what does it mean for you to have a commitment to diversity and equity? How have you demonstrated that commitment and how would you see yourself demonstrating it here? Uh, board member Anderson, Spencer, uh, when with A, describe your understanding of diversity and equity and why they're important to this position. G, how would you work to support an environment that is welcoming, inclusive, and increasingly diverse? J, how would you help to create, support a climate that is supportive and respectful that values different perspective and experiences? and explain your experiences working with diverse student populations. Did you say A, G, and J? A, G, J, K. I would, you know, we can add to, I was fine with, um, with 10 as it is, or it can be, more can be added, I don't know. So let me throw this out here. The only thing I thought of in this question, and I, and I like it, all the other ones the way they are, what we've done previously, um, but I actually tied this one in with the code of conduct, right? So I think some of the feedback that we've all heard is, you know, how do we ensure equity in the code of conduct and how it's enforced? And I'd, I'd love to hear like a candidate's thought on on the relation between those two things and and how is it, you know, as as we in, you know enforce our code of conduct, which I think is very robust. Um, you know, how do we do that equitably and, and see what their thoughts are on that? Um, Code of conduct factored in, you know, a few questions earlier, um, but it ties into the equity piece here. So I don't know. I, I'm not sure where that falls in, but I just thought I'd throw that out. That's I made a note of fell under unrelated questions into any category, really, because it touches on both of them. So I'm open to any thoughts there. Stu, so would you be fine with adding to the end? What is your position on equitable application of our code of conduct? that would be that'd be fantastic that's basically the you know yeah the whole question i have as long as we have room for it to to, you know, to, to factor it in just i i like I, I like well that you said that it came out of the a question to go someplace space um the thing that i what i was looking at 10 is more like the diversity equity um and inclusive practices policies the work that we made uh, be doing and it's specifically mentioned in the strategic plan. I understand, I understand the discipline application that you're bringing, but um, I kind of saw it as a different, saw this as a different question. Like, cause I think like with the discipline part, it gets into disproportionality and that type of stuff. But this is more like the broader diversity stuff that's in the strategic plan. So I think we should include the last statement I put in the chat and I can scroll down and do it. Um, with our new number six. So let me go back and read that one. Um, describe your philosophy on student discipline. 
Uh, what are you communicating with principals and teachers about managing the learning environment and setting expectations for student behavior? How would you hold administrators accountable for student learning and the overall culture of schools? And then what is your position on equitable application of our code of conduct? That might be a good fit, Amy, yeah. Right, yeah, I, I, it fits better there. Different different than the, the equity and diversity portion I, that's kind of number 10 talks about. Like, or or what would you ask about the disproportionality in our data, in our discipline data? More I so. love that for a second round that drilling down, but literally by Monday, I don't think it is fair to ask them if they're not already familiar with our disproportionality of discipline in the district um, to do that by Monday. But second round, absolutely. Yeah, I think the part that, you know, that, that fits in six, I'm fine with that there. So are we adding to 10 or no? Which might be I would say no, but no. What yep. Brian, Brian suggests and add that to six. Correct. Okay. All right. Okay, so we got 10 then. So 10 is our original 10? I have no idea what number we're on. I think it's 11. <clears throat> Ms. Show, what do you have? <laughs> mm -hmm. Your original number 10 would be your now number 11. Yes, I'm keeping them together in my head, yes. All right. Well, then, I think that we are done. Do we think the combination of these questions is an hour? Do yeah, do we, do right. we think it feels okay for an hour? <clears throat> it, it's an hour. Um, we had, because um, we've got our time slots. And um, I think, la like I said last time, we had an hour and a half in the other interviews. But I think that because we gave the extra time, the time was filled. I think that, you know, that, like I so said, they'll have the questions. They'll be able to digest and present the information even as they're working their way through how they want to. That's the, the purpose of giving it to them ahead of time. And I like what we did last time of putting kind of like the shot clock up in a way that's not overwhelming and then allow them to manage the interview because we interact with them by physically asking them the questions, but they already have them in front of them and they can just, and because that's gonna tell us something about them. Like, how do you manage your time to give us the information that we need to know. How much time did we give them last time? Yeah, hour, to, hour 30 minutes. And for President Levy, you're gonna send the, they're gonna have these questions again, same as last time, right? To, to, to yeah. follow. Yeah, Mrs. Mrs. Schultz is when she she's gonna send me the document, and then I'll send that to Dan Nirad, and we gotta put these other pieces with it. So he'll probably get that in the morning. Perfect. So we're doing the questions, CISA six, and the strategic plan going out to the candidates, correct? Yeah, let me look for something right quick. Yes, they can't do. The, yep. Strategic plan part, I know I got that in the document. Questions Ms. Shope was providing. I'm gonna check board docs real quick for that CISA six part. Are you ready to receive a motion to adjourn? Mm, Ms. Shope, can you just re uh, quickly review what you have to make sure you have everything you need and then we'll be ready after if Ms. Shope is comfortable. I believe I, believe I have everything I need okay. from our discussions and, and that and what I'm planning to do is create the document I'll email it to you and Dan Murad and then you can give him I'll tell him that in the email you'll give him the okay if I captured everything correctly and 
you'll be sending him the additional documents to send to the candidates. Did I hear I that correctly as to that's what you wanted done or not? Uh, you're doing good. I'm listening. I have a question with Google Meet. So it says the messages are being recorded with the call. Can you send us a copy of the chat? I mean, the only thing is, is the questions and kind of how we sorted that out, um, because that might be helpful for President Levy when you're reviewing the questions that Ms. Shope sends you, just to make sure that everything's captured. Uh, I, I was gonna say, I don't think I'll need that, but um, sure, I could use that. Let me see. Um, okay, I, so I have a hard time hearing hearing no. you. You were saying to send what you had been typing in the in the notes or in the chat, and you said capture that and send that along with the questions I'm preparing so that we make sure everything was captured. Mm -hmm. Correct. So board president Levy says he doesn't need it. So I think we're good. And I just did a copy paste. Okay. So I have a personal copy. So unless someone else wants it and they're not able to do a copy paste, I think we're good. Okay. All right. Then we are ready for a motion. Uh, Great job, everyone. I make a motion to adjourn. Second. It's been moved by board member Brian Anderson, seconded by board member Amy Levy. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, board member. Uh, all those opposed? Okay, motion passes unanimously. Good night, everybody. Have a good night. See you on Monday. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Thank Shaw. You.